Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We're back in the book of Mark today. We're going to be in chapter 13, where Jesus is asked a question after he rebukes his disciples promptly for getting a little too caught up in the very uh, seen things of this world. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to be together, for the wonderful worship we were able to provide to you as we sing from our hearts those words that are so true. Lord, we thank you that you are in charge of our lives, that you're sovereign in this world among all of the craziness and everything that seems to be breaking down around us. We know that you sit on your throne. And Lord, we don't understand it always, but we know that you have a purpose for everything. Help us, Lord, to understand our part in that purpose. Help us, Lord, to be led by your spirit and by your word. And Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you might make it clear to us, that you might speak to us in ways that we need to hear, that you might instruct us, that you might bring us up to be more like you. So Lord, we give you this time, we give you ourselves, and we pray that you would do that which is pleasing to you among us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're back in the book of Mark. Previously, last week, we went over chapter 12, the second half, where Jesus was asked what the greatest verse is, what the greatest commandment is. And it's interesting, it was worded that way. And he said, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And Jesus then added, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two hang all of the law and the prophets. So Jesus tells us if you wanted to boil it down and get kind of the crib notes as to what the Bible teaches, it says you have to love God with everything you have and love your neighbor the way you, you love yourself. And we know that love is a deep commitment to another's best good. It's not just an, a squishy, it's not a, oh. Because, you know, there are some people I don't feel, oh, about, but I do what's in their best interest. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, because I don't even feel, oh, that way about me. <laughs> but I do what's in my best interest. Like, you better get up, you better take a shower and get out of here. You're running late. Oh, okay. Love is a deep commitment to another's best good. It has nothing to do with how you feel necessarily. Your feelings are a wonderful caboose, but a terrible engine. They'll run your life into the ground. So we talked about Jesus's verse which he boiled down, and uh, then we were told, yes, teacher, you know, you've spoken rightly. Yep, there's all the blood of bulls and goats, goats don't uh, measure up to loving God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus, wanting to kind of fire back, asked them a question that they couldn't answer. How is it that David calls his descendant Lord, even though it's his son? Because you don't call your son Lord. And they couldn't answer. And so Jesus didn't tell them. It's interesting. So it leaves us wondering. Not really. And then Ju Jesus warns against acting, about pretending to be something you're not. And he tells the Pharisees, and it's expounded upon in Matthew, all of the woes Jesus goes through. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he tells them all the things that they do. They they broaden their phylacteries, their prayer boxes on their head and on their hand and to make it look like they're religious. They wear long robes. Good thing I'm not wearing a robe. They wear long robes and they expand, the, you know, they, they, they show all of these tassels which are for prayers. And all of this is done to be seen of men. They disfigure their face when they're fasting so that they might be seen of men. They, all of these things they do, they pray on the corners ostentatiously, there, there's a word, ostentatiously, out for everybody to see, very showy. It's a very showy thing. And so Jesus said, this is what you guys do, and you, you have your reward. But like when you're giving, you shouldn't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. And if you're going to pray, do it in a closet where nobody sees you. And your father who sees you secretly will reward you openly. So we went through all of that and uh, some of the things that Matthew brought out, and he gave us the big long list. Mark's kind of a just the facts, ma'am, sort of guy. And then when giving much is too little, we looked at this widow who came up and put 
her two mites, which is a, an eighth of a penny, into uh, the offering box. And Jesus said, that woman just gave more than everyone else because she gave out of her need, out of her livelihood. Because that sacrifice was something that was a need of hers. It wasn't the extraneous extra, which is, you know, usually how we like to give. You know, I find somebody needs a lawnmower and I have two and say, oh, you could have one. That's not hard. What's hard is when you're not sure how you're going to make the mortgage and you, you put a check in anyway. And you do what the Lord's called you to do. Or you give away something that, you know, it's a sacrifice. That's a hard thing to do. And Jesus was noting this woman. So we went over that last week. The coming judgment. Chapter 13. Uh, the verse for today is, And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus, in this final week, as he's in Jerusalem, is now prepping his disciples for what's about to come in the lifetime of some who will be there, which is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so we'll get into it. If I learn how to work this thing, I try to be smooth, <laughs> and I'm just not smooth. I want to say a little something about predictive prophecy and purifying hope. Predictive prophecy is one of those things where the Bible says something far in advance of it happening. It's one of those things that proves it's God who speaks. When a prophecy can be said, and it happens exactly as it's said, that's God. Because the only way you're going to know that is if you're outside of time. And God is the only one outside of time. So he can tell us what's going to happen and what's coming down the road. That's why we don't lean on our own understanding in all our ways we acknowledge him. And he directs our paths because he knows the future. And we don't want to be stepping in something we shouldn't be stepping in. So we follow him. First thing, only our God is outside of time and he can foretell future events or foretell them. In Isaiah 42, 8 to 9, God is kind of giving a challenge to the idols of that time. He says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So God declares, I'm not like those stupid idols that don't ever say anything. I'm going to tell you what's going on, what's coming down the pike, and it's going to happen exactly as I say. In Isaiah 41, 21 to 23 says, present your case, says the Lord. This is a challenge to the idols. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter. That we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it all together. God being a little sarcastic. If you haven't noticed my tone. It's like, see what you got. Come on, dazzle us. Show us, tell us what's going to happen. And obviously they don't. In fact... All you have to do is be standing in the grocery line too long and you can look over and you can find all these wonderful prophecies <laughs> and, and all those wonderful magazines. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. The other thing's going to happen. Did you know that 98.7% of all of it never happens? Mm -hmm. The top 10 were actually sampled during a period of time and the top seven of the ten, not one thing happened that they said. JFK comes back. UFO lands on the White House. <laughs> Nostradamus said this, if you just change a few words. You see, that doesn't cut it. So I feel like God could challenge the National Enquirer and say, put up, boys. What do you got? Show us. Tell us of the things that's going to happen. And 98.7%. And the thing is, if you make a guess, you have a 50-50 chance. So they did worse than random chance. 
These are things that make me go. Hmm. 1 John 3, 2 to 3 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, meaning Christ, we shall be like him. Don't you look forward to that day? For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Did you catch that? If you have a hope that Jesus is coming back and you're his, and he's going to make you like him, that hope changes the way you live. Amen. It changes the way you live. Because if I know I'm going home and I keep that in mind, and the Lord's going to make me like himself, oh boy, I'm, I'm going to live different, aren't I? I'm going to be mindful of all the silly things in this world, like a a terrible debate on TV <laughs> that makes me mourn and say, this is the best we got. I like want everyone to say it. This is the best we got. I know it's improper English, but it's just, it's from my gut. Like a couple of school age kids throwing rocks at each other. Please people. I just yearn for a man to stand up and say, I will serve the American people and do what is right before God. Amen. Oh, don't you yearn for that day. It's coming. And only Jesus can fill those shoes. Amen. Because our hope is in him. It's not in the White House. Can I get a hearty amen? amen. I'm feeling a little zealous about that. <laughs> Now, I am going to vote, okay, because I think there are things that are important enough to actually put in and vote, but this is the best we got. Anyway, I'm sorry. Destruction of the temple. Jesus is going to talk about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. He's going to move on to talk about signs and the beginning of sorrows, which are going to come. He's going to speak about persecution, where the church is going to be under heavy persecution, not just in the first century, but it's actually upcoming events. He's going to talk about the Great Tribulation, the seven-year tribulation on the earth, which is going to be worse than anything that's ever happened. The second half will be absolutely horrid. Uh, we're given pictures of that throughout the scriptures, the Old Testament and Book of Revelation. Jesus' second coming and what that will look like. And... He gives the fig tree as an example of how we can kind of tell time. So let's jump in. Jesus' message for us today, he's going to say, and watch for these words, take heed. That's a direction to anybody who's listening to what Jesus says. Take heed. Keep your eye on, pay attention to, be alert to the fact of. That's what take heed means. Do not be troubled. Does it sound like a suggestion? No. Nope. Do not be troubled. That's what he says. Number three, endure. Hupotazo is the word, which means to remain under stress. It's the picture of a weightlifter with, you know, 800 pounds up over his head, and he stands there for a few seconds until the judge has given the thumbs up. That's what it is. That's enduring. Pray. Jesus tells us to pray and to watch. You know, it's funny. The Romans would assign somebody to watch the door, make sure nobody would get in who didn't belong there. If somebody fell asleep on duty, you know what they'd do? They'd set them on fire and woke them up. Do you think you'd repeat that a second time? Anyway, watch. So we're going to go through the we're going to go through the chapter. Yes. Then, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, "Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here." And Jesus answered and said to him, "Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down." That just sounds like such an Eeyore moment. Like, 
we're here in Jerusalem. We're in the temple. Jesus is leaving the temple. And he's like, the disciples are like, look at the stones. This is awesome. Look at this place. By the way, that's exactly what happened. Amen. Jesus said about 40 years before it happened that this would happen. And it did. And the temple is no more, is it? There's something in its place now called Dome of the Rock, which is not just a literal thing, but I think it's a symbolic thing. Um, Jesus held them accountable for not knowing the day of his arrival. And the judgment fell on Jerusalem because of that. Jesus explains that. So this is actually one of their stones uh, that's actually under the foundation. Um, this is the biggest stone that there is. It's 47 feet long, eight feet high, and 12 feet deep. It weighs about 400 tons, and a ton is 2,000 pounds. And they moved it there from a quarry. And if you try to take a knife and stick it between the stones, you can't. And there's no mortar. You know, like you have bricks and you have mortar in between. There's no mortar. It's stone on stone. These people are pretty smart. Now, if you're watching those little magazines at the, at the, at the register, it'll tell you aliens built it. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. All of those stones that got thrown down, they're still right there. And there's some of them in the valley that's nearby. And so we can see that exactly what Jesus said is exactly what happened. The temple once stood there. And Titus Vespasian, when he went um, against the city of Jerusalem, sieged it, finally broke into it, 70 AD, and over a million Jews were killed. They were murdered. And then there were about 900,000 of them that were taken away as slaves. So that was the fall of Jerusalem and the temple. Well, Titus Vespasian wanted to keep the temple intact because it was this beautiful white limestone building. It glistened in the sun. You could see it from far away and wanted to keep it as a prize. But his boys got a little out of control and they threw fire in the temple. It caught fire and the heat burned everything, including the gold that was on everything on the inside. They rescued some of the furniture and took some of the things out that they could but all of the gold which overlaid the panels on the wall. Now, this is Herod's temple, which took uh, over 40 years to build. It all melted. And it all melted between the cracks of the stones. And so what the Romans did was they pried all the stones off of each other and pulled the gold out. That's why it happened exactly like Jesus said it would happen, because they were greedy and they were going after the gold. It would have been easier to get had they not burned the place down. But we know that God had other plans. Jesus is asked, look at these stones. Aren't, aren't, isn't it awesome? Look at these buildings. And he goes, you see them? You're impressed by them? You think they're nice? Guess what? There's not going to be one stone left upon another. That had to be a downer for the disciples. Because you remember, especially Peter and John and James... These guys were looking for Jesus to walk into Jerusalem and take the throne of his father, David, and take over. And they wanted to sit, you know, on his right and his left-hand side. And so they're thinking Jesus is going to do this. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you see all this? You're not inheriting this, boys. <laughs> it's going down. So they were concerned about that. By the way, this is uh, Titus Vespasian or at least a likeness of him. It's not really him. You know that. After he was done sacking Jerusalem and the temple, they built an arch for him. This is called the Arch of Titus, and you'll find it in Rome, and it still stands to this day. You see the relief on the right-hand side, and that is all of the soldiers taking away all the implements from the temple. So this is a real deal thing that happened, and Jesus said it would happen before it happened. It was very unfortunate. And the Jews right now are very concerned because they have no sacrifice. You see, the Old Testament teaches that you have to come Passover 
bring a lamb, one year old, has to be perfect in every way, and it will atone by the sacrifice of this animal, by you putting your hands on its head as it dies, certainly that will get Peter's attention. But that's how your sins are forgiven, by your faith, by trusting and walking in God's obedience. They can't do that anymore. There is no sacrifice for sin left. And so they're trying to rebuild the temple and they're doing all that they can to get that place back. But there's a mosque on it. You know, what's going to happen. There's going to be war, but we already know this. And there's the relief on the arch of Titus verse three. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Andrew joins them asked him privately, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of all these things will be fulfilled. So Jesus is about to tell them and answer their question. It's important to know the question. Of course, Mark is a more concise view. If you go to Matthew, Matthew has a, uh, one thing added to it. It says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Matthew giving us the fuller picture of what the question is, it's kind of threefold so that you understand that. So when we look at it, I want you to think about all of these words. You're going to see them come up as Jesus explains. Take heed, do not be troubled, endure, pray, and watch. So keep your eyes out. Because that is the common thread that runs through this. Sometimes we can get a little eschatology uh, amped and miss what Jesus is trying to say. And he says over and over and over in the text, and we can miss it. So Jesus answered them saying, and began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. Now we know he's talking to four disciples, right? For many will come in my name, or building upon my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That sounds pretty worldwide, doesn't it? And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. It's like, oh, Jesus has given us the good news first. This is the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus is placing that on a timeline and saying, you can look for these things in the very beginning. And it doesn't sound like it's going to get any better from there. That's why it's called the great tribulation. So he talks about people who are deceivers who will come and he talks about wars and rumors of wars and then signs on the earth and pestilence. You guys know who this guy is? Okay, we have no moonies here. That's, that's a man known as Reverend Sun Young Moon who has said he's the Messiah. Just so you know. And when he marries people, he marries a bunch of them. Some of them haven't even met each other. It's crazy. How'd you like that guy to pick out your next wife? You might not know who this guy is. David Koresh. Some of you people are good. You're going to get an A in this quiz. <laughs> David Koresh. Another person claiming, claiming to be the Messiah. How about this guy? It's not Elvis. It's Jim Jones. There are people... There are people all over, and there are more people today who are claiming to be the Messiah than ever before, which I think is an absolutely amazing thing. There are rabbis who claim to be the Messiah, or the Mashiach, if you will. Um, there's one rabbi, he says he's in conversations with the Messiah right now. He's talking with him. So Jesus is correct. People will do this, and they'll think, oh, I'm he and people will follow after them. 
Also, what you'll see is earthquakes in divers places in lots of different places. By the way, there was a big one that just hit Turkey recently, uh, if you guys are aware of it. It used to be that every 10 years, you could bank on about nine killer earthquakes. This decade, 172. Not because they're little teeny ones like we had here in New Jersey. I mean, these are over 7.0. So do you think they've increased? All you have to do is look it up. I mean, we, we live in a computer age. Ask Siri, she'll tell you. <laughs> and famine. The amazing thing is we have more food and more storage now than ever in history, and we have more of a lack now than ever before. We're looking at 8 billion people on the planet. 8 I mean, I, don't, I can't even conceive of that. Eight billion people on the planet. And there are many starving. There are many who are slaves. There are many who are being trafficked. We live in this very comfortable bubble and we complain about it. There are people with great need throughout this world and it's not gonna get any better because the hearts of men will grow cold and they will, their love will die. Jesus continuing in verse 9, but watch out for yourselves. Watch out for yourselves. Jesus tells you to watch out for yourself. You should take heed. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. Notice he said synagogues. He's speaking to the Jews. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. In other words, when you're not allowed to share the gospel and it becomes a hate crime and you get arrested, why did that happen? So that you could share the gospel. Because some of those judges and stuff will never hear the gospel from somebody else because they surround themselves with yes men. For my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Sound important? I bet you it's important to you. Because if somebody didn't share the gospel with you, where would you be? But when they arrest you and they deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate on what you will speak. Some of you people are just worried about that. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. By the way, these are the words of Jesus. He says, if, if you're going to go and give a defense, don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Don't ruminate on it. Well, should I say it this way? Should I say it that way? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll offend him if I... Oh, oh, I'm anxious just thinking about it. Jesus said, do not worry. Beforehand. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit can speak through you? Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. Suddenly a passage comes to your mind and you say it to somebody and you're like, oh, I didn't even know I remembered that. <laughs> yes. That's one of his functions, actually, is to bring to mind everything that Jesus has spoken to us. The Holy Spirit will guide you and you don't have to worry about it. Now, brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen. That's a reminder to me that I have something to endure for. Because sometimes in the middle of suffering, you give up because you lose sight of the prize. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, I just started my diet today. Is that pizza? <laughs> if you forget the goal, suddenly you're much more tend, you tend to be much more of a compromiser. But if you remember where you're headed, if you remember whose you are, if you remember who it is who helps us, that is something that encourages us. And he will guide us until we endure to the end. So... 
Notice, take heed, do not be troubled, endure, pray, watch. He continues all throughout all of these passages the same way. Now, if you remember Stephen, first martyr in the book of Acts, Stephen was accused of saying something bad about Moses and the law. And so they put him to trial right there in the open square, which, by the way, is not a trial at all. It was another sham, like when Jesus got hung on a cross. And so it says they looked on his face and he had the face of an angel. And he recited all of the history of the Jewish people. And he spoke very highly of Moses, who he supposedly was speaking against. And he spoke about the prophets. And at the very end of this giant history lesson, where he schooled them in their own history, he goes, you uncircumcised of heart, you always resist the Holy Spirit. <gasps> and they tore their clothes and they stoned him to death. Not because of anything he was accused of, but because he called them heart of heart. And all of your forefathers that you're so proud to say you belong to, they, which one of the prophets weren't assassinated by you guys? Jesus brings that up. And so they stoned Stephen to death. And I read his sermon in the book of Acts. If you get a chance to read it, it's amazing. And this dude wasn't even an elder. He's a deacon. He's, can I get that cup for you? Can I throw that plate out for you? Can, can I get you something? Yeah, a cup of water, I'll, I'll be right there. You know, that's, what, that's what he did. And he preached a better sermon than I could ever do here on a Sunday morning. Why? Because he didn't premeditate. He had a relationship with the living God. And the Spirit of God took over. And he looks up and he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And that's when he gave up his spirit. And he said, Lord, do not hold this against, against their account. In other words, don't hold this against them, which is what Jesus prayed on the cross. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit? You want to see miracles? It means that we have to die to ourselves and our natural tendency to do everything our way and make sure we have control of everything and say, Lord, take over. Take my words. Take my mouth. Amen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The scripture says here, and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So this is a prerequisite to the end is that everybody gets to hear it the whole known world. So it's always, it's always wondered, who's the last person to hear the gospel and accept Jesus Christ as Savior? Could it be that you will be the person sharing the gospel with the last person who needs to accept Jesus Christ? And that will be the end. I just wonder who that will be. It's like a lottery. I wonder who will win that. Jesus continues in verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing where it ought not. It's a little cryptic. I'll explain it. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea, who's he speaking to? The Jews flee into the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house nor enter or take anything out of his house. In other words, this is an emergency. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. Pray? For in those days, there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. That also includes the time of Noah, which that was some pretty hardcore difficulty, I would think. If anyone says to you, oh, I'm sorry. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. It's like the Lord steps in before the nuclear bombs go off. But the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Is it possible to shorten days? That seems like a scientific uh, anomaly, right? 
and yet the scripture says they will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive. By the way, not all miracles are God's power. I think of people that see things all over the place. And I think, what is the fruit of that distraction? Oh, we got to go and there's the statue that cries or a statue that bleeds or so what? What does that do? It distracts. You remember that everybody was waiting for a, a, a flying saucer to land in a certain place, a hail bop or whatever, some kind of crazy thing was going on in the sky and it was going to, everybody thought they were going to go and, you know, be beamed up, watch one too many Star Trek episodes. <laughs> Do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I like the if possible, because it means we're secure, but don't get sloppy. But take heed. See, I have told you all these things beforehand. In Daniel, just to let you know, the this aberration that Jesus is talking about being in the place where it should not. He's talking about the Antichrist setting himself up to be worshipped as God. There's a seven-year tribulation in the middle of it. He's going to be revealed. He's going to make a treaty with Israel. There's going to be peace and safety. He's going to rise, and he's going to claim himself to be God. And the Jews are going to wake up and say, oh, my goodness, what have we done? This guy is not God. And suddenly the Jews are going to be like public enemy number one because they're going to see Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. You got 144,000, which are going to be preachers in the end times. If you read through the book of Revelation, it's, it's a wonder. But Jesus points us back to Daniel chapter nine. And Daniel says, know therefore and understand that from the, go come, the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, that means Jesus, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus was crucified, but not because he did anything wrong. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince who will come, not of Jesus, because he just died, right? The prince who will come is the Antichrist. And the people of the Antichrist are the ones who are going to take down the wall. And who were they? The Romans, those Italians. <laughs> the Romans. Okay, just so we're tracking. They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. In other words, it's going to be all at once. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. That's what Jesus is talking about now. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. A period of seven. But the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, which means the temple has to be rebuilt for that to happen, because there is no temple right now. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. That's what Jesus is speaking of. Even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In other words, this guy is going to rise himself up, claim himself to be God, and he's going to just, everything is going to just bust loose at that point in time. So, that's what Jesus is pointing back to with the book of Daniel. Verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, now he's speaking of after that, that's a time marker, by the way. In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels to gather together his elect from the four winds. By the way, that's north, south, east, and west. From the farthest part of the earth and from the farthest part of heaven. By the way, that's what we call the final chapter. That's the end. Now, this has not happened yet, thankfully. Jesus didn't come and take all his people and then say, bye, because what in the world are we doing here? But that's the final chapter of what Jesus explains, the timeline of what's going on. And that is the end of the age, which answers the question that Matthew make, made sure he marked down. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and it puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, you know that it's near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. All these things, including Jesus coming back and the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light and the stars all falling from the sky. All these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus says it's all going to wrap up like this. When you start seeing these things going on, you know something's going on. Such as when you see a tree and it's spring and it starts to give leaves and they're soft and supple branches and things begin to happen, you know it's coming and it's coming soon. And he says it's just like that with the fig tree. The fig tree always symbolizes what in the scriptures? Israel. Israel. It's rather interesting. Israel is God's timepiece on the earth. You watch Israel, you know what God's up to. So a fig tree, when it starts to get supple and ready to pop out some fruit, that's how you know. You see, Jesus is answering their question. They are saying, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? He's answering those three questions in sequence. He's going through all of the rest of time, and all of these things are prophesied. And he's not found in the National Enquirer. By the way, there's an interesting thing right here, uh, if you want to get into arguments. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Now, for you and I, we say, well, what, what, is it, what is the generation he's speaking of? Is he talking about the generation he's prophesying to? The disciples? Is he prophesying of the generation who sees these signs occurring? Or does it mean a third thing? Hmm. Actually, you remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, an evil and wicked generation seeks a sign, and none will be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. He's talking about a particular group of people or a line of people, a genetic line of people. He's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about the Jews will not perish until all these things happen. That's what I believe it's saying. And that makes a whole lot of sense, and it fits into everything else, that you don't have to worry about the Jewish nation being gone. In fact, some people thought God was done with the Jews, and now the church is what the Jews were, and it's not that way. The Jews are still there, and God's promises are still in effect. So, and I, and I put things up here you can't even read. I'm so sorry. That's the explanation of what that means of the generation word. But of the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son. So Jesus is confessing he doesn't know the date, but only the father. Jesus again says, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Yeah, I would, I would definitely keep an eye on things. It's like a man going to a far country, he left his house, and he gave authority to his servants, and to each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, or at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest suddenly 
he find you sleeping? And you know what happens if you're asleep at the door? And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So do you see these words reoccurring throughout this entire dissertation that Jesus is giving? Sometimes we get so caught up on wanting to know everything and when it will be. And Jesus said, I don't know. And people say, well, see, that just proves he's not God because God knows everything. Or it proves that he's divested himself of anything sacred and he's just a man. No, it just means, it means it's not my job. It's not my job to know. It's not my job to tell you. And I think it's important that you know your place, right? You talk about things that you know, and you don't talk about things you don't know. Jesus said it's only the Father's. The, the Father is the architect. He's the one who structures everything. He's the God that I know. Jesus is the God I see in human flesh. And the Holy Spirit is the one that I sense and feel. And he's the one who leads me, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps me to understand what the scripture says. In John 15, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Jesus kind of nails something down here. He says, listen, when you're a servant, you don't necessarily have to know what the master's doing. You just do what he tells you to do. Jesus is here as a servant. He should run for office. Amen? Amen. Amen. Holy mackerel, you people are reluctant. <laughs> Sorry. So what do I get out of this passage? Without going into a whole eschatological background and opening up the book of Revelation and every prophet that ever spoke, Jesus says in this passage in chapter 13, take heed. How many times? A bunch. Enough that you should be paying attention. Do not be troubled. Do not worry. Jesus said that. Don't worry. When the world goes crazy, what are you going to do? Don't worry. Amen. Number three, you've got to endure. The one who endures to the end will be saved, will be preserved, will be cared for by God. But we have a responsibility. Take heed. Do not be troubled. Endure. Pray. God listens when we pray. I don't understand how a sovereign God listens to a low life like me. Other than I want to pray led of the spirit, those things that he wants me to pray. And watch. We are supposed to watch. It's not like, eh, whatever. But it's also not being glued to CNN on the TV. Like, oh, oh, oh. Am I hyperventilating? I'm sorry. <laughs> Watch, pray, endure, take heed, do not be troubled. Amen? Amen. Beloved, we are now the children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's Jesus and his words about the coming judgment. Next week, it will be the preparation for betrayal. We will see Jesus in the most intimate of occasions, the night before or the night of his arrest, and then into the crucifixion. So... Stay tuned, and we're going to look at the most important historical event that ever occurred, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope you guys will stick around today because we have a couple of baptisms. John, you're so excited like you're going down, bro. Because there are some folks that are identifying with the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll be sharing testimonies. So guys, stick around.